Daniel Lakai is with us, Chief Economist of uh, Tresses, uh, Jess John. Let's, let's pick up um, the, the topic and run with it here. Um, quite often before a major recession, you see the oil price double. We have seen the oil price double, and this phenomena has rung true since the 70s. Mm. And here we are now with some softening growth trends and some questions being raised about whether oil continues to weaken from here or gets stronger. Mm. Just bring those two stories together, together for us, Daniel. Are, are we in the foothills of an economic slowdown? And what role has oil played? Mm. And is it still playing that role if the Saudis manage to get the price back up? Yes, I think that uh, the, the reality of the global slowdown is what's missing in the picture. I think that if you look at the leading indicators, you're seeing that uh, expectations of demand growth, more importantly, all expectations of industrial production are also softening. Nothing dramatic, but they're softening quite a bit more than what uh, uh, analysts were expecting, weren't they? Uh, at the same time, what you've had is exactly the same thing to a certain extent, similar to what happened in 2008. You have on one side a rally in the oil price that actually accelerates the slowdown in the western world in the consumer nations so what ends up happening is that the uh, let's say uh, the, the policy of OPEC of trying to lift prices back up closer to $90 a barrel has actually accelerated the the slowdown for the uh, for the consumer nations and what we're seeing right now is a, a double-edged sword for them on one side you have the evidence of oversupply the the Russian minister mentioned it yesterday at the same time what you have is that if they decide to cut they would not offset that oversupply. The Russian minister was talking about 1.1 million barrels a day. So it's a difficult one. Yes, the definitely. change of direction, though, is quite different, where it's been a real stop-start, we're going to tighten, we're going to loosen. That's quite different in this time round. I'd also make the point that what's also changed over the course of 10-odd years since the last financial crisis is the sharing of information. You now have an ability to hear so many different voices across economies, not just in your sector. So for the Saudis sitting there trying to make a decision, they're not just hearing what reactions are in the oil industry. They're hearing in all different emerging markets right across the world, all different consumer markets across the world, all different businesses across the world how does it alter the course this time round because based on the amount of information they're getting it would seem hard that they would tighten mm. um, that they would drive up prices going into another crisis yeah I think that I think that producers particularly and in general when when you, the, all these all these international bodies they suffer from confirmation bias so they believe that they get lots of information from lots of different people but what actually they do is actually get information from very few people so that actually say the same thing is what you're saying. they actually say the same thing they were saying that the market was going to tighten the market was tightening the market was tightening for months on end and they were very happy with that on on, on top of that they wanted to lift prices above the level that was our would say sustainable for the global economy they actually did they actually did for a while and then it fires back so the problem I think is is confirmation bias the problem is that what they're saying right now in the conference again comes back to the same rhetoric is they were saying that the market is going to tighten now that they're saying that is amply supplied but it will tighten so it's a very in reality the oil industry knows that neither producers nor the industry are very good at predicting oil prices. well let me ask you a very straightforward question the Saudis have managed to prevent or stop the continued decline after 10 consecutive down sessions here um, the market is going up people will be tempted to buy into that on the back of the management of supply do you think there is the possibility here for a sustained bull run for the oil price I don't think so. I don't think so. And the, re and the reason why I don't think so is because the, the forces behind the slowdown in demand are stronger than what we are already discounting in the price, which is that OPEC will do whatever they can do in order to reduce the oversupply. But, but there's just so much they can do, and we were just seeing it. Russia is at 11.4 million barrels a day. They haven't even cut. They have, uh, there's been a lot about you know, what we are going to do, but they don't do it. And we forget the, the big problem as well for them, not for the, not for the consumers, which is, the US. The US is the biggest oil producer in the world, 11.6 million barrels a day. They were saying that the, the, the US would not produce more than 10 million barrels a day. They're at 11.6, they're going to 12. Big headache for price inflation.
We're going to take the break. We'll be back in a moment. Daniel, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, let's come back to uh, Daniel Lakai, uh, Chief Economist for uh, Tracius Gestion. I, I want to pick up on the, um, the growth story here. Um, is this a soft patch or are we now beginning to see, as we talked about synchronised growth, yeah. synchronised slowdown? We are seeing synchronized slowdown. Because is it here to stay, though? Yeah, I think it is. And I think that it is because if you look at, the, uh, at what has, at what drove the perception of global synchronized growth was fundamentally global synchronized debt growth. And uh, all of that debt has created very little added uh, productivity. More importantly, what you have also seen is that overcapacity has been building from Western nations into emerging markets. So I think that the problem that we see is that uh, it, it's sort of like there were very large experiments, uh, zero interest rates, aidnomics, you mm. name it, the PBOC's uh, slow uh, adjustment. And what ended up happening was that what we were doing were perpetuating the imbalances of the past. So we, the only thing that we're seeing is the headache, is the, it's sort of like right now a change of path uh, into a more realistic uh, estimates of growth, which, are, which is stagnation. Dan, that sets us up nicely for the start of trade for Monday. And what we're looking at now on futures, a slight bounce back after what was a flat a week a day here in Europe on Friday. Uh, in particular, FTSE futures look to be supported by the weakness in sterling around the latest Brexit chaos. Eight tenths higher is where FTSE futures are marching so far. We'll be right back. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. And for more on how Singles Day stacks up against other international shopping days, go online to cnbc.com. We're just chatting about technology overall because it's been a very volatile few weeks, volatile couple of months. Every time you've had this sort of bout of selling on Wall Street, it seems to be concentrated around technology more so than elsewhere. And what jumps out to me after spending all week at a technology conference is that you've still not got the big fang stocks solving the problems. All the questions we've had around regulation. I closed up my week speaking to the DNC's head of technology, a man who'd just come from Uber, so they recruited a real technology guru. And he basically said to me that Facebook Twitter, or all the social media platforms need to hire more people to try and deal with the challenge that they're facing on fake news, that you can't just build out artificial intelligence to do this. So again, one very specific area of regulation where you've already seen Facebook spend up, it's like 10,000 people they hired at the start of the year, compress their margins right through in 2019 for next year because they've had to hire more people, but it's still not enough. Yeah. So for me, it tells you that there is a reason for the sell-off, even if people don't know why stocks are falling so aggressively. What do you think, Dan? Margin compression, margin compression. It happens every time you get too big. and and. People tend to forget that once you get too big, many companies will start to be running to stand still. They need to hire a lot more people just to remain, not to grow, just to remain where they are. Obviously, these companies have massive margins and they need to hire more people and they will continue to make uh, uh, good profits. However, it is all about estimates and the estimates are too aggressive. Basically, if you look at most of the technology bulls estimates for, for earnings growth, what they're estimating is that there's very little increase in the cost base whilst margins continue to expand. That is extremely difficult when you reach that size. So that's probably what the market is starting to see, is getting a little bit of concern about diminishing margins while the companies continue to be very profitable and growing, obviously. So where, where do you go uh, within the equity market at the moment if you are looking for a measure of protection but also some return of your capital? Mm. Because as you point out in, in your notes, it, uh, all markets are a relative story. Exactly. And if you don't believe that technology continues to improve its margin from here and profitability, then you've got to go somewhere else, it seems. So where is that yeah. other location? In technology, you need to look at smaller companies. You need to look at the companies that are going to be there, you know, getting there where these giants are already uh, and where the multiples are not so aggressive, where the valuations are not so demanding. In terms of uh, where you need to be to protect yourself, unfortunately, you have to, well, unfortunately, no. You have, to, I think, in my, uh, what you have to look for is dollar based assets. You have to look for assets that have uh, companies that have dollar revenues are exposed to the US market and they are exposed uh, and that get better margins through stronger dollar because um, in general what you are going to see next year is that as 
you have almost 90% of countries are going to be increasing their deficits next year, 90%, okay? That means that you're going to have a lot of liquidity drawn out of equity markets into bond markets, like it or not. More importantly, there's going to be a lot of central banks that are not going to defend their currencies. As such, the most likely scenario is that you, have, you continue to see a flight to safety. So look for safe, sort of no, boring sort of growth stories which exist out there in, in dollar-based assets. Can I just take you back to that comment? Why do you think countries are not going to defend their currencies? Because in times of crisis, particularly around a lot of the EM countries, we've seen action yeah. to defend currencies yeah. because of the amount of debt that some of these countries have. So, yeah. so, so why do you make that, that blanket statement? The, the uh, global debt in US dollars has increased dramatically in the past years based on the perception that the dollar was always going to be weak and that interest rates were always going to be low. So emerging market debt in dollars went from 30% of all their debt to more than 40%. Now they need to keep their reserves uh, their policy needs to be to keep their reserves in order not to default on that debt. And as such, they cannot defend their currency. So their interest is more in maintaining the level of reserves, which by the way, emerging markets have done admirably throughout this last uh, two years. But in the next years in which you face a maturity wall of uh, dollar-denominated debt, they need to keep those reserves and therefore they will not be able to defend their currency. It's, it's, it's one or the other. Hmm. So the message uh, f as far as the FX markets are concerned is that the dollar continues to uh, remain strong or only strengthens from here largely? In my opinion, the dollar continues to be strong. If you think about, you know, the dollar is not doing a lot, actually, if no. you look at the long-term structure of the... Well, it's been busy this morning, I have to it, say, but uh, that, <laughs> might <oil> <laughs> that might be oil-related. That might be dollar-oil-related. No, but if you look at the trend, it's not a very aggressive trend. No. I think it's going to move the dollar index uh, around those levels. Getting It will not get back to the levels it was before 2005. But I think that it will move around that area, which means that the dollar is relatively stronger compared to the rest of the currencies. But you're seeing mostly not a dollar strong, but a weakening of other currencies because of this, these imbalances that we're talking about. Fiscal and trade deficits are likely to get worse, not better than what is estimated right now. We were mentioning before buybacks. Mm -hmm. Buybacks have been a driving force of the expansion of multiples in the US market. And buybacks have massively decreased in the last months. And uh, they're uh, assumed to be decreasing further la next year. The other problem is that a lot. I seem to see a lot of people that retain a bullish view based on the Fed will not do what they say they will do. Isn't that very dangerous? A surprise uh, could be dangerous only, I think, if the interest rates rise very rapidly. Historically, the stocks do well, even with rising rates. But again, a surprise with rapidly rising rates or a higher level of rates that would influence the ability to borrow, that could be influential. Mm. And, but it's very, very unlikely then that what we have seen already in this uh, in these quarter results and this earnings season so far, which is weakening margins and sales growth way below EPS growth. So as the tax cut impact fades, what you get is that margin compression, that weaker sales growth, whilst at the same time you have a global slowdown, which I think that is becoming more and more evident now. Huh? It may be we have seen some bearish signals. We noticed something that we have seen pretty rarely where the large caps are making new highs while the small caps are failing to keep pace. And sometimes uh, only a few large cap companies are big clients of small caps. So when we see that divergence, it could be bearish. We saw that before the global mm -hmm. financial crisis. We saw it before the tech bubble burst. So there has been some evidence of slowdown so far. Yeah.
If you consider the, the size of the swing, so quite a, a swift move high for the oil stocks. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating start to the European trading session here. Uh, let's get back to Daniel Lakai. He joins us, Chief Economist, uh, Tristan's Jess John, who's our guest host uh, around the desk this morning. Just to deal with some of the short-term issues, I mean, it doesn't seem to be troubling the market this morning that um, Italy is still on the naughty step uh, yeah. and that the government is going to represent its uh, budget tomorrow. Um, why is this not a factor in the market thinking this morning? The market is thinking that uh, the worse the situation with Italy gets, the looser the policy of the ECB. And probably rightly so. I don't think that they're wrong in that perception. Right. Uh, however, it does not improve the situation both at the, on the macro side. More importantly, it creates a contagion effect into other economies. You have already seen that uh, there have been problems with the budget in Spain. There have been problems with the budget in, in France, there, in Portugal as well, uh, in Slovenia. So what, uh, what we, this, is, this showdown between the Italian government and the European Union is likely, unfortunately, to be won by the Italian government because the uh, European Union doesn't want to sort of uh, create an image of we're going to be too, too, too tough, while at the same time trying to bring them to a level of, let's say, uh, logic. However, the budget in itself is completely illogical. The macro estimates are completely science fiction. The spending is actually uh, too uh, optimistic, but the revenue side is impossible. And the problem that uh, the European Union is facing with, the, with some countries' budgets, like Spain, like France, like, uh, like Portugal, yeah. is precisely on those revenue estimates. So they're, they're completely impossible with the macro picture that we're talking about all morning. No? And um, unfortunately, what that leads is the European Union becomes, let's say, more uh, benign with Italy then it creates a domino effect to Spain, to Portugal, to others, and unfortunately, then it creates a problem in terms of debt and, uh, and obviously the, okay. the spreads are rising. All right, well, we'll come back to this in just a second, Daniel. I wanna... When you talk about the, uh, your estimates of uh, growth for 17 to 19, and at the same time you're mentioning that uh, obviously that the company is very linked to global GDP, we're seeing you know, some relevant uh, reductions in GDP estimates and uh, at the same time an increase in the volatility because of uh, hurricanes and, and natural disasters. Is it easy to make uh, adjustments to your estimates in order to uh, see these, these, these differences or, or, or is, it, uh, uh, is it still a comfortably wide uh, assumption that allows you to be you know, strong with that, with those, with those estimates. Well, I think the thing that really benefits us is the fact we're a global business, so we can reallocate capital from some of our less strongly performing markets. Say, for example, U.S. commercial currently is a weaker market. We can expand in places like uh, Brazil. We can expand in Australia. We're just expanding into Indonesia. So, I mean, we can move the money around to try and find the right spot to try and get the best performance from it. On the claim side of things, on the NATCATs, I mean, of course, that's why we're here. People buy insurance, and these are the, the points in time where they expect us to perform. That's a good reminder of, I mean, the, the value of the product that we bring. So I don't worry about either of these two things. They may have short-term impacts, but the global nature of the business allows us to adjust and adjust quickly. And the claims are simply part of what we do. We pay claims. Daniel Lakai is with us, uh, Chief Economist for Trusted Gesture. Da Daniel, I just want to talk about the Chinese economy. And um, there are some very interesting noises coming out of the economy at me at the moment that would suggest that maybe there are some trends that are being concealed from the market that we should take note of. And I'm much minded um, to focus on this comment around loans to private enterprises. You would have seen this through the weekend with the Chinese banking regulators saying that the financial system, the banks, must continue to extend loans into this part of the economy. Yeah. Is there a risk that actually we continue to see a withdrawal of liquidity for the private sector enterprises that, quite frankly, um, have, have got an increasingly smaller part of the business pie at yeah. the moment. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, uh, the situation in China is very complicated because the government wants to do two things that are almost contradictory in nature. On one side, it wants to deleverage the economy, and on the other side, it wants to uh, incentivize lending precisely to the sectors that have driven the large part, the largest part of that uh, debt increase. Uh, there is another problem as well. The non-performing loan ratio in uh, Chinese banks is widely challenged and uh, we all disagree or at least uh, question that it's so low. Uh, additionally, uh, the PBOC keeps injecting liquidity in order to achieve better rates of growth. So it's a very difficult balance because on one side you try to uh, incentivize credit for the growing part of the economy but at the same time you have a vast majority of businesses that are not generating returns above the cost of capital. So. It is a very difficult issue and it comes down to the, fo to the following thing, is that China cannot grow 6.6, 6.5% and deleverage at the same time. It's impossible. Its entire country model is based on debt. So can we get into what's reflected in the stock market there? Because the Shanghai Composite was on the most terrific course for investors this year, if I can put it that way. It was falling, it kept on falling, it was falling again, it kept on falling and then reached a low. Yeah. Since then, since the, that low point in October, we have seen a change. The market's gone up, then there's been low points. The market's gone up, there's been low points. But every low point that's been marked since that low in October has been higher. Yeah. Are we now seeing a change in course after what has been a very grim outlook for the Shanghai Composite? In order to be bullish about the Chinese market, you need to believe that the yuan will not devalue further. And I think that this is an, uh, something that very few people tend to put together is that the, the devaluation of the yuan has been an integral part of the collapse of the market. And in a market in which so many companies pledge shares in order, uh, in order to get financing, etc., it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the earnings season hasn't been very good. We have seen uh, some of the fastest growing companies growing a lot less than expected. Therefore, uh, it needs to be a stabilization both on the monetary policy and also to see a little bit of improvement on the headlines about trade and about the, the, the growth of the economy as well. You said that you didn't think countries would defend their currencies, that the holding reserves would be the most dominant factor. Does that apply to China as well when it comes to defending the yuan? Well, I think so. I think that uh, China is, in my opinion, doing the wrong thing by continuing to devalue the yuan uh, as a stealth move in order to offset the impact of, uh, of trade uh, sanctions, etc. Uh, why? Because trade sanctions uh, can't the trade uh, uh, you know tariffs can put a little bit of a dent on 10 percent of the economy but the devaluation is is hurting the entire economy because it's an economy that needs a strong yuan in order to improve the purchasing power of salaries and to make households be able to repay their debts. So inflation is rising, the, the economy is getting slower. And I think that the problem here is that the Chinese are doing exactly the same as so many other countries, is that they're trying to offset their internal imbalances by devaluing the currency. As such, I think that there's very likely that the Yuan can break the seven barrier, and that would, is not a bullish signal for, for the, the Shanghai index, unfortunately. All right, Dan, thank you for that. Let's take the break. We'll be back in just a moment. Still to come. I want to just push on to what we're seeing on foreign exchange markets. Uh, some significant moves in the dollar this morning, around a 16-month high. The casualties, the euro and sterling in particular, and you can see it, seven tenths down versus euro, in, uh, almost 1% down versus sterling different uh, impacts here, I, I would say, uh, concerns around the Fed still raising rates and around sterling with the Brexit chaos that we've had. Yeah, um, uh, why, isn't, um, why isn't the European equity market as a whole getting a bigger lift from weakness in the euro at the moment? I mean, it's happening for the FTSE, but it doesn't seem to happen for uh, euro-based assets. I think it's the, the lack of strength of the Eurozone's earnings season. It's been the worst earnings season since 2014. 
uh, investors are getting a little bit concerned about very optimistic estimates for 2019 earnings and guidance has not been particularly appealing. So I think that probably that is that is something that is another thing is that one of the key factors of the uh, global slowdown that we have been discussing is also eurozone slowdown. So if you have eurozone slowdown, emerging market turmoil. And obviously, the large part of the exports that the Eurozone uh, makes to the rest of the world are to the US and emerging markets. Therefore, you have almost a perfect storm against earnings. Dan, I just want to mention how quickly we've moved in 55 minutes on the European markets. The DAX has been on about a 1% journey from highs to lows. Yeah. That's quite a wide range, isn't it, when you talk Huge. about the movement intraday? Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how quickly the market round trips in a single in in a few minutes actually and i think it's the nervousness is very high because you, for for markets to to sort of grind higher you need macro earnings and inflation none of those three factors are helping right now so i think that that's Daniel. what's happening We've got to wrap it up, unfortunately. That's the end of the programme. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into Squawk Box. Thank you for being our guest oh, host. Oh, uh, and that's it from Karen and myself and the rest of the team. But stay with the channel. Street Signs up after this.